Hi everyone, welcome to episode four of my pre-Comrades uh, 2022 uh, vlog, uh, my training series to help uh, some runners prepare for Comrades post-COVID and getting into back into all things ultra uh, running. Um, so today I just want to speak uh, a little bit about the conditions and some things that you can do to help you prepare. Um, uh, first of all, speaking about the race date and the weather. Um, you know, at the moment, uh, most of us in the Southern Hemisphere are training through some very short days, uh, very dark, cold mornings, um, which uh, with the weather in at the end of August, the weather is at its most volatile uh, in this area. At that time, you can get extremes of weather. Um, it could be cold and windy. It could be wet. Um, so these long, dark mornings are, are going to help you prepare for that. It's going to help you know what the right kit is to wear, although... It's probably not wet, um, but uh, if it is wet, what you need to do is layer up thin layers uh, and then cover with something that's going to protect you from the rain so that the air that is close to your skin stays next to your skin, but that does breathe. Um, so kit-wise, just uh, it's worth experimenting and knowing what you're going to need uh, to if, if you get a weather day like that. Uh, it is possible that the weather might be pretty cold. Uh, it is possible that we might get windy and wet. Uh, if it is wet, uh, it's likely that the wind will come with it in August. Uh, the wind does pick up and we do get windy days. Um, it's also a chance that we might get a warm day. Um, the weather at the moment is not really going to be helping you prepare for that. So doing heat tolerance training, you know, the maximum temperature in the middle of the day just doesn't get up high enough to do it. So, uh, yeah, hopefully you've done some heat tolerance training and are able to do that too. at other times of the year. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, take advantage of uh, your summer weather and do some heat tolerance training. Don't get out there so early, let the temperature get up and, and get out there and learn to cope with it. Um, it. It is very important, you know, if you have the ability to do it, it is very important to do it. And maybe even train indoors on treadmill, uh, crank the heat up and uh, get going like that. I don't know, just do your best. Um, uh, by August, the days will be uh, a little bit uh, longer um, and we shouldn't be having to deal with the dark as much. So that, that is the, the only benefit to the, the, the amended race date. Uh, personally, I hope that they don't do it at the end of August again. It's been pretty tough and I think a lot of people are going to be caught short uh, with the uh, winter days um, having not uh, been that motivated in the cold and the dark to get out there and do the mileage that they should. <clears throat> then I just wanted to chat about some specifics to do with the race and some things that you can do on your long runs uh, to help you prepare uh, specifically for comrades to run to your target time. So let's just get on to that. Uh, just pulling up the PowerPoint for you. So there is the comrades down route profile. This is uh, off my GPS data from the 2018 down run. So it is the run up the freeway on the way out of Marisburg and then the run into Moses Mabida Stadium along <coughs> NMR or it's now called Masabala Yengwa Avenue, which gives you a longer run into the finish. Um, the Comrades route really does demand a conservative start and to run to your potential time, it really does demand a negative split. All of the records on the Comrades route have been run that way, <clears throat> and it really has been proven over and over again that running a negative split is the way to do it. So let's have a look at some specific points. You've got your start, and I've got two red circles there on the right there. The one is on the way down uh, Bothus Hill. As you pass, there's some shops on your right. As you're running down Bothus Hill, those shops are at the same altitude as the start. So from that, and that's about, you've run about 55 Ks uh, by the time you get there. Uh, you got about just less than 35 k's to go. <coughs> so <coughs> um, uh, those, that sort of first two thirds of comrades, you have undulated. Uh, then you're then going to climb out of uh, that point there. You're going to run up what's called Heartbreak Hill. And then you're going to descend down through Hillcrest. And somewhere around about the Heritage Market, maybe just after the Heritage Market, <clears throat> there's some petrol stations, one on the left, one on the right. You're going to be at about the same altitude again. Again, at that point, you're going to, you, you're going to have run about another <clears throat> three and a half k's further. Um, and again, you're at the same altitude point. 
and you are then going to plummet into Durban. There really is a lot of downhill running from that point. And if you have any legs left underneath you, you really are going to be able to make a lot of time. And that is why you should be able to run a negative split. You should have saved some kind of energy and effort and you should be able to make up a lot of time. <clears throat> Two significant points here. Running from the start and up to Omnas Road, the first blue circle, that really is a very demanding part of the route. You are going to have climbed a lot from 660 meters in altitude at the start to just over 850. Lots of climbing in that first 18 kilometers. It's going to take a lot out of you. You're going to need to be conservative and save a lot of energy. And then right in the middle of the route there, you've got your Enchonga. So it's a relatively big climb on the way up. And then when you run down that uh, hill into, it takes you into halfway, that downhill is going to, your legs are going to have run a long way. And if you're not careful on that downhill, it's going to take a lot out of you. The impact is going to start to really count on that run down into halfway. So you're really going to need to be conservative and save your effort and be careful with your effort level. So there's halfway. Again, <clears throat> halfway, the, the kind of circus of halfway is not actually at halfway on the down run. Um, so uh, just be aware of that. You can't, you know, look at your watch and think, oh, I'm going through halfway now. Uh, be aware of where the halfway distance is. It's somewhere in the halfway distance is uh, in the region of uh, near Arthur's Seat and the Comrades Wall kind of area. That is actual halfway. So it's a little bit further up the road than the halfway point. Um, but, you know, that is your halfway point uh, just beyond Drummond. And you, you're you going to need to save more than half your uh, effort for that. And you will make up all the time that you lose in being conservative. That yellow, big yellow circle that I've just put in there now, that is the only part of the route that really is flat. Uh, and that's the only part of the route where you should be running uh, to your target pace, uh, whatever your average target pace is. <clears throat> the climb out of Maritzburg, you really, the only downhills are the two Polly's Hills and the run out of Maritzburg down uh, to the bridge over the Doozy River. Um, so you're going to need to be conservative. You're going to need to save your effort. You're going to need to climb conservatively and you're going to need to be prepared to lose time on that part of the route. And then climbing up out of uh, Drummond, there are three climbs uh, followed by three short kind of descents or it's going to flatten out. <clears throat> your legs are going to be nice and softened by the time you get there. And again, you're going to need to be prepared time, be conservative with your effort. Do not worry about it. If you run correctly and if you've done the training and you've done the mileage, you will make the time back up. So yeah, those two parts where I've got those kind of uh, purpley arrows is where you are going to be conservative with your effort and you're going to be need to be prepared to lose time on those parts of the route. And you're going to make it all back up. If you've got any legs left beneath you, you're going to make it all back up on that uh, absolute plummet down into Durban uh, in the last 35 Ks of the route. And I would say to say 35 Ks is even too much. You're going to need to be conservative all the way through to Cowie's Hill. And um, once you've gone over the top of Cowie's Hill, you're going to need to uh, make up time after that. Then if you're looking at, I'm just going to mention the up route. Uh, so again, we've got those three points that are at the same altitude uh, in Hillcrest, just beyond Hillcrest and at the finish. Uh, so you're going to need to climb up to those points. You've got Amlas Road sitting at there at uh, 18 kilometers to go. You've got a huge climb. You're going to feel like you are climbing incessantly uh, as you uh, make your way up out of Durban. The only significant downs that you're going to be aware of are running down the back of Cowie's Hill and running down Heartbreak Hill. The rest of the time, you're going to feel like you're just never, ever running downhill. Um, you're then going to need to be careful and be conservative on the descent uh, down into Drummond and look after your legs. You're then going to have that huge big hump uh, getting over in Tonga, having run more than a marathon. Uh, be careful not to take it out of your legs. Be conservative. Uh, if necessary, take walks and things. And then if you've got legs left on an up run, you should then run this part of the route maybe a little bit faster than your target pace and then be ready to descend into Maritzburg. But on a down run, on an up run, sorry, you're going to need to be conservative with your descending and use the characteristics of the route to make up your time. But be really, con uh, be really deliberate with your running technique. Um, so when you're going downhill, you, you don't need to necessarily pick up your effort to make up time because, you know, the, just the nature of descending should help you with that. 
But what you do need to do is you need to be careful with impact. So you need to take a lead from trail runners here. You need to keep the impact points um, as close to beneath your hips as possible. With, uh, with long distance running, we, we do slightly go forwards. When you're running faster, it should be straight underneath your hips. <clears throat> but we do go slightly in front of that, but as close to you as possible, as underneath your hips as possible, your impact point should go almost straight down. And then uh, your legs should go behind you. And then when you're running downhill, you keep your running cadence up um, relatively high and pick your cadence up. And that is what is going to, number one, it's going to save your effort. So your heart rate should come down and it is going to save your effort, but it is going to pick up your running pace, but you're going to need to practice getting your cadence up. It's going to feel really difficult. Um, and that's what's going to make up your time when you're running downhill. And that goes, you know, no matter which way you're running downhill. And when you're looking after your legs, for example, when you're running uh, around that halfway point, when there's quite a lot of altitude loss, um, no matter which way on the route you're running, you're going to need to really look after your legs and be conservative with your effort, but be making up time by doing that. So I just thought I'd look at a couple of training runs uh, as a model of how to look. And this is a recent training run that I did. Um, as I mentioned previously, I live relatively close to the Comrade route. I can run 4Ks. It gets me onto the route at uh, 40 foot cutting. And then obviously the roads are not closed. So can't run the route exactly, but uh, try as close as possible. And <clears throat> on this day, <clears throat> I ran out to 40 foot cutting and then ran up to the top of Cowies, ran a little bit over the top and then turned around and ran home. You can see from the time split that it's not even because I'm running a negative split on the way back. I was more than 10 minutes faster on the way back. Um, again, focusing on that downhill running technique, picking up my cadence and, uh, and just naturally running faster uh, without really having to put in any extra effort. But then at the end, practicing picking up effort levels and getting the heart rate up to try and make up a bit of time where I needed to on the little climbs uh, that do happen on the way back. Although um, my net uh, result is that I'm running down. Um, I am able to put in a bit of ex uh, extra effort. So climb from the start, but learn to be conservative, learn what that feels like, and then descend on tired legs. At the end of a training week, you can really mimic what it feels like um, towards the end of an ultra marathon, what it, what it feels like to train, to be on those tired legs and picking up your cadence and trying to keep your impact down mm -hmm. and learning the technique and learning to trust yourself and learn what it feels like um, so that you can run a negative split on a day like Comrades Day. Then this is my pace data. You can see the white line is my average line. So you can see on the first half there, I'm really well below the average for most of my run, really uh, doing a lot of climbing. And then on the way back down, my pace picks up and most of the time I am significantly above the average, but I'm trying to descend quickly and efficiently, keeping the cadence up and minimizing my impact, giving me that uh, more than 10 minute faster second half and learning, you know, learning what it feels like, training and practicing what it feels like, uh, and planning what will hopefully be my comrade strategy, and running a negative split. So here's another training run. Uh, I'll try and let you figure out while I'm talking a little bit and mincing my words. Uh, the altitude uh, markers there should give you a little bit of a clue as to where it is, uh, because that's the start of comrades. So uh, that's a little mini route tester. We've run out of Maritzburg. Obviously, this is more old, the old comrades route uh, on, close, on roads that are open. So we've wandered our way out through Maritzburg um, and then run over the back of Polly's and down the two Polly's hills and then up to Omnas Road and then run to Camperdown on the comrades route. And then I did a couple of little loops there trying to make uh, some distance up on this day, which is why it goes up and down a little bit at the end there with some gentle ups and downs. But yeah, if you look at that reader, just look at how demanding it is. Um, so you really need to be conservative with your effort levels um, at the start of comrades to look after your legs. Um, it really is quite a demanding thing, you know. The only downhills you're going to be aware of, you will be aware of running out of Maritzburg, running down to the Doozy River, and then down those two Polly's Hills, and just look at the altitudes there marked uh, 661 that's that's an approximate value it's not exactly uh, uh, the gps does go with barometric pressure so it's not exact but you're running up to over 800 meters in altitude 
quite a big climb. And when you climb out of Lion Park, uh, sorry, from the bottom of uh, from the bottom of Little Polly's up to Lion Park, and then on up to uh, Omnos Road, that really is an incessant climb. Uh, we have a crazy running culture as a result of influence and, uh, of Cormades' influence uh, in South Africa, and um, it's only matched by the trail running community. When you're training, especially on your long runs, if you're training for a down run, try and run 200 meters of altitude uh, gain per 10 kilometers, and if you're training for an up run, that's got to be 300 meters. <clears throat> on a down run, you still got 1,200 meters of climbing, um though we talk about it as being a down run you are doing 1200 meters of climbing net and on an up run that goes up to 1800 meters which gives you your net of about 600 meters of altitude gain uh, from Durban to Marisburg so yeah you really should uh, be aware of that if you are running for example this is hypothetical obviously but if you're running a 90k week try and match the 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 numbers of comrades marathon in your week um but look at it as a per 10 kilometers unit, you know. Um, and just to give you an indication, this is my pace and heart rate data. So you can see the red line is my heart rate data. So you can see I'm picking up my effort level at the end of my run, um, trying to get used to what it feels like. This is the end of a training week when I've got all the fatigue of a whole training week uh, with my uh, recovery scheduled for after that. Um, picking it up towards the end of the run, being conservative while I'm climbing at the start. And then the net result of that is that your pace picks up as the route profile kind of evens out and you can run a bit faster because you're not climbing so much anymore. So learn to practice that on your training days uh, and that will give you your negative uh, pace uh, split. And, you know, practicing that and learning what it feels like is really important. Um, then I just wanted to speak about a route tester, whether or not to do one. Um, so there are two schools of thought. The one is the physiological school of thought and the other one is psychological. From a physiological point of view, there's no point in going anywhere beyond sort of three or three and a half hours uh, is the, <clears throat> the kind of physiological limit of where you need to train to. There's no additional training benefit if you go further than that or, or longer than that time-wise. All it does is increase your training load. And what that does is it increases your recovery time. And that then has a negative payoff or payback uh, for the following week. Um, so you've got to be very careful. And it's one of the reasons why kind of running a marathon in your comrades training lead up is maybe not a good idea. It's because you're going to, you definitely, for most of us, we're going to be running for longer than three hours, you know. <clears throat> and for those who can run a sub three hour, you're going to be putting in so much effort that that effort level then picks up and then you pay, you have that, that, <clears throat> that negative payback as a result of that. So if you go too far or too hard or your, your, your loads go beyond what is ideal for recovery and yeah, you, you need to be careful of that and don't run your comrades on your qualifying day or on your route tester day. So <clears throat> I know a lot of people left it quite late with qualifying. I've got a lot of, a lot of acquaintances that ran their um, qualifier relatively recently. It's, it, today is the 7th of July while I'm recording this, but seven and a half weeks ago until Comrades. And a lot of people ran their qualifier like uh, just the other day. <clears throat> so that's really not ideal. Uh, route tester for most people is coming up at the end of next week or the week after. Be very careful, be very conservative. If you're going to do that, there are benefits to it, which are mainly psychological. <clears throat> uh, Comrades is an unusually tough ultra with lots of altitude gain and loss, and you do need to be you do need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And if you do do a route tester, uh, if it is a positive experience, it can benefit you from a psychological point of view, kind of convincing you that you can do it. But be careful; you're going to need to run conservatively and run slowly. Don't run your comrades on route testing. You're going to have a lot of mileage in your legs by now, and it's going to be tempting. You should feel relatively good compared to how you felt running the same distances uh, a few weeks ago. Um, but be careful. Run slower. Be conservative. Just spend time on your legs. It's not important how fast you run. Just spend time on your legs. Reduce the load and make sure that you prioritize recovery and schedule a recovery for the week after. And that way, uh, the psychological benefits can outweigh the physiological loads. <clears throat> um, by now, you should have a lot of 
kind of, I guess, resistance in your legs or resilience in your legs. <clears throat> and you should be able to cope fairly well with a nice long run, but run slower. So here's a map of a retester that I did. Uh, this is pre-2018, comrades. Uh, and yeah, you can see the, the kind of uh, orangey and greeny means I'm running very, very slowly. Uh, and here's my pace and data. And you can see that I averaged, I, I was aiming at a bull run um, that comrades. And yeah, I ran pretty slowly. My average heart rate was pretty low, averaging 138 there. That is, that is that my average heart there is well within my kind of my level two or my aerobic zone, uh, running nice and slowly. And you can see here, I did not pick up my pace at the end. I did not pick up my effort level. All I'm doing is spending time on my legs, um, getting to know what it feels like. Uh, this, the, what I tend to do is in this week, I tend to um, run a lot of consecutive days uh, early in the week, then have a rest day on about the Thursday. Then I do a short run, like a 10, 12 kilometer run at six minutes a K on the Friday and then run the route tester on the Saturday and then have the Sunday off, uh, which gives me an extra rest day. And then I'll schedule a recovery week for the week after. Uh, so that, you know, the physiological loads are pretty high and you need to be very careful with them if you're going to do a root tester. And I do my root tester. I believe in doing the root tester uh, earlier rather than later. So I try and do it with six uh, weeks to go before comrades. Uh, I know a lot of people do it with five to go. Um, but I, I believe in getting it out of the way earlier than that. Um, so now I'd like to look at uh, some race plans. So this is actually at two oceans. Um, and what happened here, I can't remember what year exactly, it's about 2014 approximately, I'd say. Uh, from memory, um, I was running with an older GPS unit um, that uh, didn't have uh, lots of the fancy metrics that my newer one does. Um, but it does demonstrate how, uh, obviously, you know, proper execution in training is what prepared me for this. And then executing, executing on race day also gave me a race strategy that worked out as well. So I ran really conservatively at the start. Um, but you remember, you also have to take into account the route profile. And you I mean, I remember going to Two Oceans for the first time. And that first, like, especially that first 21 kilometers of the Two Oceans route, I'd never run so flat in my life, you know, being from KZN where there's just hills everywhere. Um, and I was able to really keep my effort level quite low and try and put some emphasis on running efficiently. Um, and then running over Chapman's Peak, which is that first, you know, these are little chappies and, the, and big chappies. I was able to look after my legs and be conservative. And you can see the dip in pace that matches the one above each other. So as I go over that first Chapman's Peak Hill, uh, so here where my cursor is on the screen, you can see that my pace dips. Um, I don't have the heart rate data on my GPS um, with this unit, but my heart rate did dip. I used to wear a separate heart rate monitor at that stage. Um, I did allow my heart rate, you know, I don't or not to pick up and allow my pace to dip. Then look after my legs going down Chapman's Peak here. So my pace again, it does pick up, but not dramatically running down the hill. And I remember looking after my legs, I was running with a, a running friend of mine and she actually ran away from me uh, running down the hill um, and I let her go um, and did catch her later and did finish uh, a little bit ahead of her. Um, but yeah, keeping that effort level down, looking after my legs on the downhill, then again, allowing my pace to drop as I'm uh, running over Constantia. But then as I was getting towards this top of Constantia, I realized that I was uh, feeling pretty good and I did. I was able to pick up my effort level at the end near the top um, as the climb got steeper. And then with 10 kilometers to go, I went through, I know the kind of the conventional wisdom for two oceans is that you should run through the marathon mark in about 340. I ran through the marathon mark in 344. You know, I had four minutes slower than um, ideal time, I get, or well, ideal in inverted commas. So, four, four minutes behind schedule to run a sub five hour um, 
two oceans. Uh, and I was able to make up all of that time in the last 10 kilometers on the way, basically downhill off the top of Constantia and in to UCT. Uh, and I ran a, um, I ran through the 46 Ks mark in, I was over 410. It was 410 in a few seconds on my watch, I remember. So I had to run a sub 50, uh, 10 kilometers to get in um, under five hours. And I ran a 46 minute and a few seconds uh, uh, last 10 kilometers to get me in uh, in a, a 4.56. Uh, and I was only able to do that because of the conservative start and saving the effort. Uh, you know, physiologically, I had saved the effort. And also, I still had my legs underneath me. And I remember, you I passed, I, I would say I passed more than a thousand people um, in that last sort of 12 kilometers of the race. And even going up um, Constantia, I was uh, able to pass a lot of people. So it shows you what, even, even when you've got a relatively short uh, uh, part of the route in which you can take advantage of the profile, it shows you you really can take, uh, take a lot of time and make up a lot of time. Um, so there's the, the conservative part of Chapman's Peak uh, marked, and then the conservative part going over uh, Constantia, and then I was able to make up all of that time at the end there with the red circle. And you can see that blue average or the blue speed line is well above the white average speed line, able to make up the time that I needed to get in under five hours or running down the hill. Um, and that, you know, that part of the two oceans route really is quite jarring parts of it. You know, you've got, you've got camber to deal with as well in parts of the route. But I was still, I was able to keep my legs turning over and be efficient with that running technique that I have mentioned. Um, so let's look at a comrade's day. So I just want to pull this thing up and out of the way here. So this is this is my 2018 comrades data. Um, um, and you can see that long running. Um, I've got my heart rate shown here. So really, really uh, overall pretty conservative. Um, and you can see that at the start where I'm climbing a lot, uh, my heart rate is lower. Um, there I've got that point uh, marked. Uh, I sp I've spoken about it uh, going down by this hill. That's at the same altitude. So at 54.23 kilometers going down by this hill, shops on your right hand side. That's when you're at the same altitude and uh, undulating to there. Uh, my time going through the Winston Park timing mat uh, in 2018 was six hours and four minutes. Um, if you work out, I should have been actually a little bit under six hours running to a consistent, constant pace. Um, but basically, I had to run a, two, a sub 256 uh, last 30 kilometers uh, to go sub nine hours. And because of the execution, well, because of practicing a lot of the training and then executing it on a race day and conserving effort, I was able to do it. Um, the major part of the time that I made up was on the part of the route that is now circled. So you can see there, my heart rate starts to <coughs> bump up a little bit. <coughs> so I ran up Cowie's Hill. I didn't uh, manage not. Uh, to, uh, I think I walked uh, 20 steps. And this is another part. When you've got a climb, think about where the most demanding part of the climb is. On the down run, uh, when you're running up Cowie's Hill, the most demanding part of the climb is the first part of the climb. That is the steepest part of the climb. Once you up that steepest part, it flattens out quite significantly. That was the only part I walked. And then from there, I was able to actually run with increased effort, uh, picking up my heart rate. And then running over the top of Cowie's and running down through Westville was where I made up um, all of the time that I made it, uh, needed to make up. Obviously, though, running down through Hillcrest and Kloof, um, I had also been able to take advantage of the profile uh, and I had made up time on those parts of the route without uh, picking up any extra effort by running efficiently. So by the time I got to that point in Westville there, I had made up all the time that I needed to make up and I remember running through 13 kilometers to go and thinking, okay, right, now I can slow, if I need to, I can slow down and I can run uh, at uh, six minutes a K and I would get in under the nine hours time barrier. And by the way, at that point, you know, uh, climbing over Cowie's Hill, I was still behind the nine hour bus at that point. Um, so they were within sight, I had caught them up, uh, but uh, running down uh, Fields Hill, they weren't in sight. Um, 
and I was behind them. So, you know, that's all a result of having been conservative over that first part of the route. Um, and uh, sorry, actually, th this part, I wanted to speak about running the other way. So the, the makeup of time that you're going to do uh, in your, if you're running an up run, you're going to make up a lot of your time on this part of the route uh, running down from on last road, but you need to be aware of those two polys hills and you need to save your effort for those two parts of, of the route. So again, you need to pick up your, you need to make up time on the downs by being efficient with your running technique and then put your effort in for the uphills um, and then make up your time. So here I've got my comrades to 18, uh, 2018 kind of summary sheet. You can see that my um, average speed there is, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you need to run at six minutes a K to run a sub nine hours comrades. Well, my average moving pace, remember at the start, uh, you're not going to move for a little while. And then there are periods of time, you know, when you're saying hello to family and friends along the side of the road, when you might be standing still uh, or trying to get to a table. So you're going to actually need to move at faster than six minutes a kilometer. Um, so my average moving pace was 550, although it gives me an average pace of 553. And <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it sounds crazy that my best pace was at 429 a kilometer. Um, but that's, again, that's taking advantage of the course and uh, running downhill efficiently without uh, picking up my pace. Um, there you can see, um, I haven't gone with my heart rate. As I'm, I'm very, very, I'm very, very aware of my heart rate when I'm running. And I do, you can see that my, my, it, I think that's a misreading actually that max heart rate of 157 but i look at one like 140 if my heart rate is is is, is around that level i know i can kind of last the whole day um and yeah I, i'm very careful when it starts to climb and i will take lots and lots of walks in the first half i think i did a count um and i walked i walked 11 times in the first half uh, and only twice in the second half. And one of those walks was the, that walk up Cowies. Um, so yeah, very, very conservative start, uh, giving me that race time of 8.57. And just be aware, you know, when you're running comrades, you are going to be standing still some of the time. So my moving time there is 8.53. Again, that's the, you know, the getting over the start line, um, stopping at the odd table trying to get a drink saying hello to my kids on the side of the road and things like that you need to be very very aware and a lot of a lot of runners uh, waste so much time um you know looking at guys there was a study done with guys who miss the metal time barrier so the the 12 hour time barrier and they are wasting so much time and if they were just a little bit more aware of kind of not losing time uh, the, a lot of those guys would have got their medals. So just be aware of not standing still too much and, and just keep moving forwards and don't lose time on Comrades Day. And then again, there, just look at my moving pace and my average pace. You can see there is a difference there. You can't, if, you, if you're aiming at a time barrier, you can't, for example, the nine hour time barrier, you've got to run at six minutes ago. You can't run at six minutes ago. You've got to run just a little bit faster than that. So um, you know, th that 10 seconds a kilometer there that I've got to run faster is a significant, you know, that's, that's, that's a lot. And if you execute this kind of thing successfully, you practice it in training, you mimic the profile of your, uh, of the comrades in your training runs, you practice that running technique, it'll give you success. So I mentioned being behind the nine hour bus. So this is 2018 comrades. This is me running through Westville. Uh, this is the dip uh, through Westville. And you can see that is the nine hour bus behind me. And that is, uh, there were two stages where I overtook them and then they overtook me. Um, so I over the first time I was aware of them was running down through Pine Town. I overtook the nine hour, there were two nine hour buses and I got ahead of them going up and over Cowie's Hill. Um, and they then got ahead of me again, uh, running up into Westville. Uh, and then I then passed them uh, running out of Westville. And um, 
I know the bus driver that day, he actually didn't make it uh, the seven hour barrier, although a lot of the runners did. He put his flag down going under toll gate and said, guys, I don't think I'm going to make it. You're going to need to make it on your own. Um, but I, I had run a negative split, uh, more negative than the nine hour bus and was feeling pretty strong at the end and could run, you know, I could run really well. And I mean, I have uh, run comrades in the past uh, where I have not run, I've not kept enough in my legs. I know the previous down run, I, I went too early uh, trying to make it to the finish. Again, that day I was trying a negative split um, and I, I was feeling under pressure and tried down both this hill to kind of uh, make up the time from there. And I went too early and, and fatigued and lost the time again and suffered a little bit of cramp. And all the time that I lost um, and that I missed the barrier, but I lost with, I had two, two bouts of cramp as a result of fatigue. Um, on this day, I waited until I was at Cowie's Hill and was quite significantly behind, as I explained earlier, and was able to make up all of the time that I needed to make up easily. A lot of it just because of the nature of the course without putting any extra effort in. And then going over the top of Cowie's and coming down Cowie's and down through Westfall, I made up all the time that I needed and got that negative split, uh, leaving the nine hour bus behind there. Uh, and you can see there, 8.51, they gave me 8.57 uh, dead is the time I was credited with. Um, that was my bull run. Um, you know, it was a, for a guy like me, I'm, my primary sport is actually paddling. I'm a canoeist. Uh, running is not my main sport for 12 weeks of the year. I'm a dedicated runner. Um, although I do use my doozy fitness because uh, we do do, you know, relative amounts of mileage. Uh, for me, kind of 50, 60 kilometers a week of running is what I do in doozy training. And then I use that uh, to get me a base and, and, and I'm actually very fit at that point. Um, having done a lot of high intensity work, I'm a lot more of a competitive paddler than I am a runner. Um, as a runner, I, I am six foot five and with very low body fat, uh, carry 90 kilograms of weight. Um, so I'm never gonna be a great comrade runner. So with the time and effort that I'm willing to put into my running, I think that kind of the nine hour threshold is about my limit uh, and was able to do it successfully with a uh, negative uh, split that day. So yeah, I was really, really very chuffed um, and uh, managed to do it on that day. Having having had the experience of, of not done it uh, or, or trying it before, but, but not being patient enough before. Uh, and obviously I've also managed it at two oceans <coughs> and there, that was my, um, I think they call it the Sainsbury medal, uh, running down the finish straight with time in the bank, able to pick up my son uh, and put him on my shoulders running down the finish straight. Um, yeah, so it really, and, and a lot of coaches do speak about it. As I said, all the records that have been set at Comrades have been run uh, with this ne uh, negative split pacing strategy, which should tell you, if you believe anything that Bruce Fordas tells you, he will suggest a negative split. So it really is the way to run I promise you, you don't bank time on comrades for every minute that you run through halfway too fast. Uh, research has been done. You're going to lose about, for every minute that you are too fast through halfway, you're going to lose about four minutes um, at the end. And it's apl applicable to all endurance sports. So as I said, I'm mainly a competitive paddler and uh, have used this kind of pacing strategy and physiology, approach to physiology uh, to all of my endurance training events. Um, and there you see me standing on the the podium, the age group podium, I will say, at Doozy, uh, alongside Hank McGregor, which uh, his pedigree is well known, uh, 11 times world champion at this stage, and uh, alongside Jacques Teron, who has represented South Africa many times and is still a very competitive paddler and has competed at a much higher level than what I have. Um, and me as a kind of less talented, uh, having to work very hard sportsman, you know, I'm able to stand on a podium with two athletes of that caliber as a result of uh, taking this kind of approach uh, and being able to execute it uh, successfully. Uh, yes, having a, a huge body of scientific uh, knowledge uh, does kind of stand me in good stead. Um, uh, and I've got far more evidence to show that this kind of training uh, and execution uh, in, in, uh, in canoeing than what I do in road running. In, in, in road running, I, uh, have struggled 
uh, far more than uh, in canoeing. So, yeah, that is what I wanted to chat to you guys about. Um, and yeah, I just wish you all the best for uh, these last few weeks. Hopefully, you've got all the training in the bank uh, that you should have. You really should be really focused and doing a fair bit of mileage um, uh, right now. Um, in terms of a peak strategy, you know, you're peaking. You should be, remember, recovery is the most important part of training. So, you know, your peak mileage should be, don't, don't leave it till three weeks out to hit your peak mileage you know, four or even five weeks out and then come down a little bit off that, that peak strategy and um, hit your peak mileage in that uh, time period. And then, although you're still doing a lot, just come down a little bit and it'll help your body with recovery. And then from there, you will be able to uh, recover a little bit better and um, be in better condition on race day. So it, uh, it really is important, you know. Mileage is important, yes. Mileage is the most important thing when you're comrades training, but recovery is the most important thing to, to focus on. So hit that peak kind of, if you can, five weeks out, um, but you can do a little bit of work and shorten that a little bit. Um, and then, you know, come back to your kind of, your longer runs can even shorten a little bit and your mileage total can even shorten just a little bit, but your body should adapt and you should, you, your recovery should improve. And then that last three weeks, you really can taper quite dramatically. I'll uh, put something together to chat about that um, closer to the time. And I already have a, a, a little summary video made of the run in uh, the, 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 you know, the finish into the most, movie the stadium which is not that familiar to a lot of people um so i'll get that up close to the time um but yeah just just being aware of what the demands of the route are trying to mimic that in training and then execute on race day it really can help you and it, it, it should be a big help to getting your time barrier goals and your medal goals so all the best with that and uh, we'll see you out on the road